Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of PBS Wisconsin's online gardening series, Let's Grow Stuff. Welcome to this year's virtual Wisconsin Garden and Landscape Expo. I hope you'll enjoy this special educational presentation, and remember, you can leave your questions for our presenter at any time by typing them into the chat, and we'll ask them in a live Q&A at the end of the session. Also, don't forget to stick around and check out everything this virtual event has to offer. From inspiring garden tours to an interactive exhibitor mall, there's something for everyone. And thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy the show. My name is George Archibald. I'm the co-founder of the International Crane Foundation. And it's a pleasure to be with garden lovers today to talk about birds that live in our landscape called cranes. And today I'm joined by the CEO and president of the Crane Foundation, Rich Belfus, who will be continuing after my introduction about our cranes here in Wisconsin and North America. The largest, the tallest flying bird is this one. It's called the whooping crane. And here's a picture of its breeding ground way up in northern Canada in Wood Buffalo National Park. This population was reduced to just 15 birds back in the early 1940s, but they've recovered. And today we have about 500 whooping cranes on this beautiful flock that breeds up there and then migrates almost 3,000 miles to winter on the coast of Texas. And just now we have those 500 birds all down there along the coast of Texas. And in the winter, they're feeding on blue crabs, uh, preparing their bodies for the long migration north in the spring. They leave in early April and a new breeding cycle. They're called whooping cranes because they have a very, very loud call. <laughs> That's a pair of whooping cranes at their nest way back up in Wood Buffalo National Park. The male and female assist in the incubation of their eggs and the incubation period is about one month. And they lavished care on their chicks for three months. They're flightless and then they develop flight and in autumn they migrate south. Whooping cranes and all cranes are famous for their behavior not only for their calls that can carry for miles, but by their courtship dances. This is a pair near Baraboo, Wisconsin in our new population here in the Midwest doing their dance. They jump and they leap, and this helps synchronize their behavior so that when the female is ready to lay her two eggs, the male is going to be fertile, they're going to mate successfully, and we're going to have a new generation of whooping cranes. The little guys are extremely fragile and they depend on aquatic animal organisms found in these marshes. The whooping crane is very dependent on wetlands as are many of the species of cranes. And it's in this habitat of shallow water that they are supported to survive, to breed. And of course, a big problem worldwide is the conservation of wetlands. And the whooping cranes used to breed in southern Wisconsin historically and across the tall grass prairies which stretch from northern Indiana, across Illinois and Iowa, up through Minnesota, into Saskatchewan and into eastern Alberta. That was the main nesting ground of the whooping crane. And when settlers came into that area, they had to live off the land and they shot the wildlife. The elk, the buffalo, the antelope disappeared, the trumpeter swans, the whooping cranes, the sandhill cranes, and the landscape was pretty devastated. Fortunately, that little group survived north of the prairies on the wetlands in Wood Buffalo National Park. But we went through a very, very bad period in the 1700s and the 1800s when this population dropped from an estimated 10,000 birds to a final count of just 15 individuals. 
And this shows the number of cranes over the years from the early 40s up until recently. Up until 1916, we, had, we counted every bird, but then as the population became larger, we had to uh, do transects and estimate the numbers. At the Crane Foundation here in Wisconsin, we keep about 40 whooping cranes in captivity. And we share a population of about 170 birds in captivity at a number of centers around the US and Canada. They produce their young in captivity and we teach them using costumes and puppets uh, to imprint on their own kind, although they're raised by uh, humans and these birds can successfully be placed back into the wild. For example, this bird was raised uh, with its parents in captivity, and then she was released in Wisconsin in 2017. And here she is with her chick this past summer and uh, on a marsh very near Baraboo, Wisconsin. This year, uh, about four whooping cranes were produced in our new flock and are now starting to migrate. Now we have the other species of crane, the sandhill crane, and the normal color of a sandhill crane is light gray. That's what they look like today, like the head and neck of this bird. But in the spring, they paint their feathers with mud and it stains their feathers a beautiful brown color, which helps them to hide on their nest. So the normal color is like the back of the head of this bird. And uh, one of the reasons this crane is so successful is because they can benefit from agricultural fields around the wetlands, and they can breed on quite small wetlands. The whooping cranes require larger wetlands. And like the whooping cranes, they have two chicks, and usually they only raise one every second year. So there's a lot of, of loss with the young cranes, but that's the same in most animal species. They lavish care on their little chicks and we are very happy that in Wisconsin, our cranes have increased. Back in 1935, when Leopold wrote his beautiful marshland elegy, an essay that's published in his Sand County Almanac, he talked about the cranes. Just beyond this photograph is the Leopold Memorial Reserve and Leopold Shack, where he wrote that beautiful essay. When I came to Wisconsin in 1973, there were no sandhill cranes on these fields. There was a very small population further north in Wisconsin, but they have increased dramatically. Leopold thought back in the 1930s that the sandhill cranes would follow the path of the whooping cranes and would be gone. But they're back. They're back on our landscape here in Wisconsin in the thousands. Leopold would be thrilled. I'm always reminded through his words of the sensitivity of cranes and the profound impact if we should lose them. This is one of my favorite quotes. The sadness in some wetlands stem perhaps from their once having harbored cranes. Now they stand silent, adrift in history. We are thrilled that the calls of sandhill cranes and whooping cranes are now back on our Wisconsin landscape for us all to enjoy. The spirit of the cranes is with us. Thank you very much. And now here is Rich Belfast to tell you about the cranes in Africa. Thanks, George. Uh, great to be with all of you. And uh, my name is Rich Belfast. I'm president and CEO of the International Crane Foundation. I've worked together with George for oof, almost 30 years at the Crane Foundation. And we are very passionate about cranes and delighted you could join us for this talk. Um, George told you a little bit of the story of our whooping cranes and a little bit of sandhills, our cranes here at home. And um, I'm gonna take you uh, a little bit further afield and talk a little bit about our international world. A lot of people know our center in Baraboo. Here's a photo from our center, our remodeled center that you'll be able to see in May when we have our grand reopening. But our work is worldwide. And a lot of what my role with the Crane Foundation is, is to take you from our site in Baraboo to our world of crane conservation projects. Uh, 
And the cranes are all over the world. They occur on uh, many different continents in North America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in Australia. There's no cranes in South Africa, uh, sorry, in South America or in, in the Arctic, Antarctic today, but uh, historically there were even cranes in South America as well. Of the 15 cranes that are around the world, I'm going to tell you that the story of one crane, the wattled crane, in one place, the Kafui Flats, and give you a little flavor of the work that we do worldwide. So this is the wattled crane. It's the tallest bird in Africa that can fly, big, beautiful bird. And I'm going to show you a little video clip of these wonderful birds. Uh, this is taken at our site in Baraboo, but it really gives you a sense of how they are in the wild. There's the female tossing sticks in the air and playing, trying to get the male's attention. It's a little hard to get right now. She is dancing around. They're joyous birds. They're fascinating to watch, as you saw with the ones that George was showing you. And uh, just wonderful, amazing birds to, to see at the Crane Foundation and to see in the wild. The place I'm gonna take you to is the Kafui Flats. That's in the country of Zambia in Southern Africa. This is a map of the Kafui Flats, this big green area. It's a big floodplain. It's fed by the Kafui River, which flows right down the middle of it and spreads its water. And that supports all kinds of beautiful, wondrous wetlands, uh, vegetation communities, uh, papyrus and different reed swamps and wet floodplains, and even beautiful uh, uplands that surround it, like this giant baobab tree that's in the uplands that surround Kafui Flats. Really a beautiful landscape and ecosystem. The Kafui Flat supports all of the world's population of this species, which is the Kafui lechwe. It's a very aquatic or very wetland dependent antelope, quite a lovely animal. They're in big numbers on the Kafui Flats. Um, there's also lots of other big mammals of Africa, like the hippos and the, the sort of classic grazing lawn of, of zebras and wildebeest and other grazers that are out on these floodplains. But the Kafui Flats is also home to more wattled cranes than anywhere on Earth. There's more than 3,000 of these wattled cranes, and there's only about 9,000 in the world of this species. So it's about a third of all the wattled cranes in the world are on this floodplain. So it's very important to us and our mission at the International Crane Foundation to save the world's cranes. So this is one of our big priority places around the world. Why are there so many wattle cranes there? Uh, a couple of reasons. One is really abundant food supply for them. They eat the tubers, which is like the underground bulbs of a plant called Eliochrys. It's a spike rush. We actually have some of this plant that grows in our wetlands here in North America, but the ones in Africa and Asia uh, put down a big bulb that cranes like to eat. Several species of cranes like to eat these underground tubers or rhizomes and um, wattle cranes love them and they feed on them in huge numbers out on the floodplain. And the Kafui Flats is also a very safe place for cranes to nest. These tiny little dots in the middle of the screen are two crane eggs and they build a platform nest that sort of floats out on the water uh, during the high flood season. And that's a safe place for them to avoid the many, many predators that are out in this landscape and be able to hatch their eggs and raise chicks on all the abundance of floodplain life that's out on the floodplain. So it's a very good place for them to be. Uh, the Kafui Flats also supports uh, gray crown cranes, their cousins, a very endangered crane species that occurs across Africa. They also are in the Kafui Flats in good numbers as are lots of other birds. In fact, more than 470 bird species, which is way more than we have ever had in the state of Wisconsin here, um, occur just on this floodplain of the Kafui Flats. It's really a magnificent place and best known for its birds, although of course it has uh, many important mammals as well. Well, the, the Kafui Flats floodplain is also, besides being so important for wildlife, it's really important for people. People use the natural resources of the floodplain to build their homes and to, to make objects that they need. They use fisheries, they graze their livestock in big numbers, and they depend on the water provided by the floodplain. So it's, it's essential to their lives. And the, the, the floodplain also creates jobs for people. There's jobs in tourism, jobs in park management. Many of people from the surrounding community are hired as scouts to help patrol the reserve. So it's very important for employment for people uh, as well as resources for their livelihood. And it's also a magnificent oasis. It gets its water from up, up in upper northern parts of Zambia where the, um, the rainwaters first fall into the river that ends up on the flats. And it's a real oasis, especially during drought years 
uh, with water and helps combat drought and water scarcity associated with climate change. Well, despite all these wonders of the floodplain, there are some extreme challenges there that we're trying to deal with. One is poaching of these lechway. They have been hunted in big numbers for a variety of reasons, and the population has been in steep decline uh, for almost 20 years now. And part of the reason we're getting more deeply involved is to, is to try and stem that decline of these lechway because they, they live hand in hand with the wattled cranes. We care about the lechway, but also our wattled cranes depend on the grazing grounds of the lechway and they live side by side. So it's a really important challenge that we have to solve. Another challenge, as I mentioned, people graze their cattle on the floodplain, but there are so many on the cattle on the floodplain. There's now far more cows than lechway. And then a really important role for us right now is to really manage the cattle population and figure out sustainable grazing in the system that's uh, compatible with cranes and with wildlife and with the lechway. Um, and not overloaded, so we have to find that delicate balance. Another, another big challenge we're dealing with is fisheries and especially permanent settlements on the floodplain. If you look carefully at this picture, this used to be a temporary fishing village, but there's actually some metal roofs there. You see some homes that are becoming more and more permanent in this rural area, and this is right in the heart of the Kafui Flats, and people like to pick highland areas to live on, of course, uh, to build homes in the middle of the floodplain. And those same highlands are what the lechway and other wildlife need during times of high floods. So there's a lot of competition for limited space. And when people are out on these upland areas, it really drives the lechway out and they have uh, less and less habitat that they can use. Other big challenges uh, throughout the region, a big one is water. Water is managed upstream of the flats by dams that really change the flow of water in the exchange of these floodwaters onto the floodplain, which really give the life to the floodplain. So it's essential to keep good flows coming from these upstream dams onto the plain so that it can stay nourished and healthy for wildlife. And also increasingly, there's a lot of pressure on mining. Believe it or not, this mine is inside of the park. Uh, we're, we're working actually to get it shut down, but it's, uh, it's right inside the park. It creates a few jobs, but not nearly as many as tourism. Uh, and it is a big problem right in, in the heart of the reserve for, for wildlife. Another big problem that we're dealing with and we've been very active on is invasive species. You're all gardeners, so you know something about dealing with problem plants and as well as good plants. And this is a shrub from Brazil that has invaded into a lot of Africa. And the mimosa shrub is taking over huge areas of the floodplain. Uh, and it, it crowds out wattled cranes, it crowds out lechway, and many other animals are unable to access the floodplain because of this thorny shrub. So lots of problems uh, on the floodplain that we're trying to deal with of the density of people and water management and invasive species and uh, poaching and many, many, many challenges. So with all of that, how do we make a difference for the cranes, for the lechway, even for the people that need this system? How do we make a, a difference? Well, the first thing we did and are doing is building a great team in Zambia. We have a wonderful team. We have an office. We're registered in the country and we're very active uh, working across the country and especially in the Kafui Flats with our great team of folks. And we have a great team and we have a vision. And our vision is a thriving floodplain for all. And it's about refinding that balance between rare and threatened species and all the wildlife on the floodplain and the needs of people in the area and finding that elusive balance where people can use the floodplain but not to excess and we can find a win-win for all involved. And we're doing this in partnership with the government of Zambia. We've signed a 20-year agreement with the government to move forward on this project and then really important partners for us in Africa, like the Endangered Wildlife Trust out of South Africa, we work with very closely and World Wildlife Fund. So this is a big project, a big partnership, uh, right in line with the government to really help bring back this floodplain. Here's a shot again of the Kafui Flats and our agreement covers two national parks and a huge floodplain area called the Kafui Flats Game Management Area. So we've sort of taken all of that on with this big agreement. And really we're, we're, we have three pillars of our support. One is law enforcement and sort of the core management of the park, trying to reverse the tide of the poaching of the lechway and other species and really make sure that they can continue to thrive on this floodplain. We're supporting all aspects of law enforcement with our project efforts there and really trying to get them well equipped and, and able to do their jobs and drawn from the communities that surround the flats. 
We're also uh, very involved in management and restoration, and I'll talk a little bit more about this invasive species mimosa that I talked about a minute ago too, but trying to make sure conditions for wattle cranes, for lechways, and other species are, are solid on the species and that the wetland remains healthy. And then finally, community support for the park and their livelihood. So how can we find that balance for grazing on the floodplain, for fisheries on the floodplain, and for other uses? So those are really our, our three pillars trying to bring better law enforcement, improve management, ecological management of the park, and to build community support and really support the livelihoods of the people that fully depend on this floodplain system. And an example where we're bringing that all together is in our Mimosa Control Project. This is a big project we've been doing there for about three years now, and it's really dealing with this terrible problem of mimosa, which covers thousands and thousands of acres on the area, and as I said, is really crowding out species that need the floodplain where it occurs. And here we have a project that's bringing together the control of the invasive species, improved livelihoods for the people that live around the park, and increasing support for conservation. So what are we doing? Well, we hired about 150 people from the community, that's from people from 150 different households to come out and they're cutting and burning the flood, the mimosa from the floodplain, systematically moving across, uh, removing the mimosa, then coming back and removing the, the re-sprouts year after year to really eliminate the mimosa from the floodplain. Uh, and then they're also helping us with these exclosure plots. If you can see that on the bottom photo, uh, we're bringing plots where we're studying uh, the removal of that mimosa and collecting data on how species, uh, plant species are recovering and how, it, how food sources are recovering that will support the uh, that will support lechway on the floodplain and also wattle cranes and other species as the mimosa is continuously cleared. Well, we've been very fortunate so far to clear more than 2,500 acres of this weed, uh, restoring these open floodplains. And it's been a wonderful response. Uh, Lechway are back in areas that we have cleared in big numbers. Wattled cranes are moving back in. And actually we had a team that was out there uh, studying bird life on the floodplain and they found several bird species that weren't recorded anywhere else in Zambia that had come back into that floodplain area. So wildlife is responding back to this removal and, and really recolonizing these critical areas. So we're really increasing the effective area of this um, park uh, by a lot. And that's, that's really wonderful. Um, and the, the people, the 150 people that were employed by the project all had income. And this is a very income scarce area. Everyone uh, in this area are subsistence farmers, which means basically they farm to keep themselves alive and they have very few options to make cash. So what did the people do with the cash from the project? Uh, they used it to pay school fees and to buy school uniforms for their kids. They used it to repair their homes and to get food supplies, uh, backup food supplies during drought periods or other stressful periods. And they used it to invest in different projects. Sometimes they in invested in goats or pigs that they could use to support their livelihoods. Sometimes they invested in beekeeping like this uh, beekeeping uh, photo here. Uh, so they in invested in different ways to improve their livelihood. So it's really a great opportunity for people to improve uh, their own situation, their own livelihoods around the flats while also providing a really big management service for the park and increasing their buy-in and support for the park as we continue on year after year with this effort. So this story, like the stories uh, George told you about the whooping cranes, you know, wherever we work, cranes really commit us to healthy landscapes. And those healthy landscapes not only support or sustain cranes, but they also support the people that live with cranes on these landscapes and so many other species, really the diversity of life on earth. So that's, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to really work for healthy landscapes through the power and the love people have for cranes um, to, make, to make a real difference. Well, I hope you will come and visit us at our Cranes of the World Education Center in Baraboo. We just were closed all last year for remodeling and in part because of the COVID crisis, we'll have our grand reopening in May. We're excited to host everyone uh, to see our all new exhibits in our new welcome center. It's really beautiful on site. It's also fantastic to stroll our prairies and our restoration area. Uh, we've got more than 250 area, uh, acres of restored prairie on our site, which is beautiful to see. We are a member-based organization and we welcome you to become a member and learn more about us and our work all around the world for the Whooping Cranes 
here in the US for the wild cranes in Africa and everywhere that we work uh, around for these birds. Or join us on one of our trips, uh, like this amazing scene from the Platte River in Nebraska. We love taking people out to see this spectacle of hundreds of thousands of sandhill cranes out on the Platte. And we take people further afield to Africa and to Asia to really experience cranes in the wild and share in the wonder of these birds and see uh, the healthy landscapes that we're working to restore and, uh, uh, and make better for people and wildlife and cranes around the world. So thank you, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure speaking with you and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of Let's Grow Stuff. Well, we just finished learning about cranes in the landscape and Rich and George are now joining us live to answer the questions that you've been sending in as you've been listening to the presentation. And don't forget, you can keep asking those questions wherever you may be watching, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, or in the live stream itself. And also don't forget, this presentation is being recorded and archived, so you can go back and review it and watch it again anytime at your leisure on any of the platforms we just mentioned. Well, Rich and George, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thanks. You're Great welcome. To be here. Well, we'll go ahead and just jump right in, and we're getting uh, several questions from viewers given you know, recent weather events in, in Texas in particular about the impact of this cold snap mm -hmm. on migration patterns. And so, Rich, maybe do you want to take this one and, and kick us off here? Sure, sure, and then George can talk a little bit to this as well. Well, it has been extremely cold uh, year. Of course, uh, cranes are very resilient to the extreme cold and uh, a number of crane species actually uh, live in really cold climates. And so they are fine. Uh, they We don't know yet if, if migration up north will be delayed at all from this, but we expect to start seeing sandhills up here in Wisconsin probably within the next couple of weeks even as, start, as soon as the snow starts going down. So they'll be fine. We've had big challenges with our staff in Texas, as probably people have heard. We have uh, board members in the Houston area and staff down in Corpus Christi part of Texas whooping, working on whooping cranes where they've had no water or limited electricity and a lot of a lot of challenges for the last few days. I know that they're, they're coping okay, but it's been a, a really difficult time for a lot of people down there. They are not hardy Wisconsin folk like us for the winter. It's been definitely been a shocker down there. So, yeah. And George, we have another question from Jody, and she's wondering how, do we know how, approximately how many cranes uh, are in Wisconsin and where might be some great places to view them as, as they're migrating through? Uh, well, sandhill cranes are almost everywhere, but the largest numbers are in the central part of the state and you can readily see sandhill cranes along the road near Cherokee Marsh, say in Madison, or Goose Pond in Madison, and Horicon Marsh. Every marshland, I think, in Wisconsin has sandhill cranes. And if people would like to participate in our mid-April sandhill crane count, they should contact the Crane Foundation at our website is savingcranes.org. And we have thousands of volunteers go out to count the sandhill cranes. The whooping cranes are very easily seen at the Nesita National Wildlife Refuge from the observation tower on the south side of the refuge. Uh, you can park your car, walk over, climb up and look out and likely see several pairs of whooping cranes and they'll be returning in the near future. We caution people if they see whooping cranes in other areas outside the protected areas not to harass them by trying to take pictures or whatever, but just keep your distance. So Rich, a question from Amanda. She's wondering how can people get involved to support your international work if they're interested in supporting some of these other projects? Well, we appreciate that very much. And, um, you know, the number one, we are a member organization. And of course, we appreciate people that, that join us and help support our work. It's, it's very, very important uh, for the work that we do around the world. We do uh, trips to these areas. Uh, uh, we run trips, international trips for people around to get, to get a feel for these areas and kind of bring them closer to home. Um, and we have a lot of people that do volunteer work for us here at the International Crane Foundation so during normal times when we're open. It's been a little challenging in these COVID times, but we have volunteers who help with tours and, and with many 
aspects of our site, helping restore our lands up near Baraboo and all. Um, so there's lots of ways that people can get involved with our organization and we're very uh, grateful to our supporters who keep our international work going. Most of it is, is supported by private donors. So that's, that's incredibly helpful to us. Well, we have a, another question of support coming in from Susan, and, and George, I'll toss this one to you. Um, she says she has a breeding pair of sandhill cranes in her yard, and so she's wondering, is there anything that she should be adding to her landscape to aid and support them? Well, if she has a dog that chases them, I suggest she keep the dog confined, especially when they have chicks. Um, I would caution about feeding the cranes, we want to keep them wild. And <clears throat> sometimes people are concerned the cranes become too, too tame and uh, they could peck a young person. So we don't want to domesticate these cranes. We want to enjoy them, but it, it's good to keep them as wild as possible. Oh, Rich, we have a question from uh, Jane, and she's wondering uh, of your methods for controlling those invasive plants, specifically do goats like the shrubs, or sort of what methods do you uh, use to keep those under control? Great question. We've been thinking more about goats. We, we've used controlling the shrub is a little bit like controlling some of our nasty shrubs in Wisconsin, like uh, black locust and other things that can invade into areas. Um, we did a lot of it by cutting by hand with our teams. Uh, they did some spot herbicide treatments where the resprouting is most problematic. That helps a lot to reduce the resprouting. And then our hope is when we really cut the shrubs down, that the natural flooding of the wetland system will help prevent um, the regeneration. Uh, they don't like to generate so much in standing water, but they'll grow just fine in standing water. So you really have to cut them down and uh, keep them underwater for that uh, for that hope. But we know, um, you know, like any prairie or any garden in Wisconsin, weeding is sort of a lifelong obligation. So we're 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 in it for the haul, long haul. As I mentioned, we're in a 20-year agreement there to do a bunch of things, but. That includes keeping support in for controlling uh, this invasive shrub, because we know if we take a couple of years off, it'll all be back in. Uh, one other thing that we're doing there is we're using a beetle, uh, a tiny little moth larvae actually, that has been tested in Uganda and Australia and some other countries that seems to work very specifically on controlling those shrubs. And so the hope is that, that uh, introducing those in will help uh, reduce the cover of the mimosa too, and then they die out once they eat out the most mimosa because they don't jump to other plants. You have to be very careful with those uh, biocontrol type techniques, but we're kind of lucky this one's been pretty well tested on this mimosa. Um, and she was asking about goats. I think goats would love to eat <laughs> mimosa. We're a little wary because goats eat everything, so you have to be very careful about um, getting them in there, but they, they're the one thing that would eat a lot of that mimosa. So the cattle that are on the floodplain won't, won't eat it at all. They avoid it. So goats are, goats are great for controlling shrubs, and um, that, that may be part of the future there. So, so George, we have a, a question coming in from Dave uh, for some uh, clarification. He says that um, this, confirming sandhills usually have two eggs but only raise one chick. Uh, maybe why is that, and what happens to that, to that other egg or that other chick? Uh, usually the both chicks will hatch. Uh, they can walk within a day or so and swim very well. And they establish a dominant subordinate relationship. They have a little tiff and the dominant bird is the stronger bird. And if there's a food scarcity, the stronger bird gets the food first. So the other bird will not survive. So it's a matter of food, but if there's a superabundance of food, uh, it's not unusual for Sandhills to raise both of the chicks. So Rich, we have a question from Lila and she's wondering, uh, given the state of the world, if you're planning any international trips this year or when you might res think you might resume. Yeah, uh, well, that's that. We had a little bit of a crystal ball for that, but our hope is to resume some international <clears throat> trips in the fall and then in the winter. Um, I'm running a trip to Chad uh, in Africa next February, which I'm hoping will go. It's a magnificent place with 
more black crown cranes than anywhere else in the world. Um, George often does a trip to Bhutan in November that he's done for many, many years. We're certainly hoping that one will go. And then uh, anything earlier than that, right now we're hopeful, uh, kind of watching how vaccines roll out, how borders reopen, uh, a lot of things out of our control, but, um, but we're hopeful to get that going again. It's one of the, you know, a lot of our, uh, you know, long-term supporters and board members and other, you know, long-term friends of the foundation have really connected in with us on these trips, getting out to see the wild cranes. We love them, so we would really love to get them going again. So, George, we have a, a, a question here from Jane, and she's wondering, when is the best time of year to uh, come and visit your new facility up in Baraboo? Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, we just redid our our visitor area, it's absolutely spectacular. And we were hoping to have a grand opening in the year 2020, but we couldn't open at all. So we are going to have a soft opening from the 1st of May and people can phone in and make reservations and we can control the flow very carefully. So please contact the Crane Foundation and sign up and you can see our new facilities and meet all 15 species of cranes in 2021. Excellent. Well, Rich, we have a question here from a viewer wondering, how many, do we know how many crane species are out there and also how many are maybe threatened or, or endangered? Yeah, well, we, there are 15 species of cranes out in the world, uh, spread all over. They're, they're in Africa, Asia, Australia, here in North America and in Europe. And um, of the 15, 11 are on what's called the red data list uh, for endangered species. That's a species that's considered uh, near threatened or vulnerable or uh, endangered or critically endangered, worst case scenario. And so yeah, 11 of the 15 cranes are on that list. And in fact, of the other four cranes, including our sandhills, they have populations that are seriously threatened too. For example, the sandhill crane is still considered a highly threatened species out on the West Coast in California up into Oregon and Washington. So cranes Can you hear Rich? Rich, I think we lost you. The just family for... of birds are, are one of the birds. Uh, oh, sorry. You're, you're breaking up, Rich. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yep, you're good. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, did I cut? Did, you, did I get that or did I get cut off there? Just the last um, maybe 20 seconds. I was just saying that. Oh, OK, well, sorry about that. Yeah, I just saying that, that uh, yeah, 11 of the 15 cranes are officially classified as threatened. And even among the cranes that are not uh, on that red data list that we that we monitor for endangered species are still uh, still have populations that are very threatened, including our own sandhills. There's an uh, endangered population of sandhills in Cuba and down in Mississippi, and even on the West Coast, they're considered really threatened, although ours here in the Midwest are doing so well. So it's it's a very threatened family of birds, and that's a big reason why we have so much focus on, on their conservation in the wild. So George, we, we, we talked a bit earlier about, you know, making sure not to go out of our way to intrude or, 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 or be disruptive to, to looking for cranes. But Melissa has a question that if we're just out hiking or kayaking and happen upon them, they sort of, you know, we don't expect to find them, we're not seeking them out. How should we behave? What's, what's the best way to move forward when that happens? Yeah, often cranes will build their nest out in shallow water and if there's an open area of water near that, if you come in a kayak, you could disturb them at the nest. So my advice is if you come across cranes in a wetland and you're in a boat, get, a, get as far away from them as you possibly can because you might disturb them at their nest. So Rich, we have a, another question from a viewer wondering about uh, sand crane habitat. And if do, do all cranes prefer wetlands or do that some live in other types of ecosystems? So all, all cranes do need wetlands for some part of their life, but some are much more dependent uh, on wetlands than others. Some of the cranes feed in wetlands. Oh, Rich, you're breaking, you're breaking up again there just a little bit, I'm afraid. And, and nest in wetlands and really, oh there, can you hear me still? There you go, now so, you're back now, yep. Yeah, sorry about that. So. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so, so uh, some of the cranes are, are really challenged, by, uh, really are very dependent on wetlands. And some of the cranes use more upland areas like the blue cranes in South Africa. And e even our sandhill cranes here are now feeding much more in agricultural areas and the Eurasian crane over uh, in the other side of the world. Um, so there's a number of crane species that, that have really shifted more into upland agricultural areas. They'll still breed down in wetlands, but they'll feed often in those upland areas. So some of the most threatened cranes really depend on, on wetlands throughout the year. And so they really need those good conditions uh, for all of their needs. Um, and others are, are a little bit more generalist and can use upland areas. So it's, so wetlands are important to all of them, but um, but there a number of them are starting to uh, get more generalist in their diets and a little bit more flexible, I guess, over time. So. Well, George, we have a, a question coming in here from Kate, and she uh, was commenting that many years ago she was able to uh, watch the training of the cranes from a glide plane at the uh, Nakusa National Wildlife Refuge. And she said it was a fantastic experience and is wondering, um, is there any chance of a program like that coming back? Uh, no, that program, it's a wonderful program, started in 2001 with an organization called Operation Migration. And they led cranes from Wisconsin to F Florida and then later just as far as Alabama until 2015. And then there were so many cranes out in the flyway that it was felt that we don't need to lead them anymore. We simply release them with the cranes that are already there and they follow cranes, which is a lot cheaper. Well, uh, Rich, I have a, a personal question for you, actually. This one's coming from me. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm wondering if you're able to speak to, again, things that we as gardeners could do in, in our own spaces and our own behavior for, for conservation. And, you know, I've, I've heard tell that, you know, peat mining, something that's in so many of our potting soils and the horticulture industry, can be pretty destructive to wetlands. And so um, wondering, you know, what else can gardeners think about as a, as a peat alternative or just other things we can do to change our behavior to support conservation in ways we might not expect? Yeah, well, wonderful question, because a lot of conservation begins at home. And I will say a few things and defer to George, who is a lifelong big gardener. But um, peat mining is a challenge. And uh, we know that uh, uh, mining of peat is a, what we would call a non-renewable resource. Peat is created over millennia, really. It's, it's a very slow process to build up and create peat. So when it's, when it's mined and used for gardens, those, that, those qualities we love, like its great ability to retain water and sort of hold it in the soil, is also a very important quality of peat in the wild. And it keeps wetlands wet throughout uh, dry periods and often maintains its own unique set of plants in the wild. So uh, alternatives are nice to that. Uh, of course, there are, there are artificial alternatives to it um, that are available on the market. Um, but um, it's good to just think about the impacts of things that we apply in our gardening and on the land, uh, fertilizers and, and pesticides and, and peat and other things, and, and try to minimize that use uh, uh, as, as part of our overall footprint on the land when we're out gardening. And then, I don't know, George, you have suggestions for what gardeners can do yeah. to help grains? <laughs> I'm an organic gardener. I don't use chemicals. Uh, there are various biological tricks like planting marigolds near your cabbage to keep, keep the bugs off them and so on. As far as peat is concerned, I found sawdust to be a good substitute. And sawdust is easy, easy to get and uh, it rots down and, and uh, it, it works out very well. So if there's a dangerous substance, try to find a substitute. And that's what we're preaching all over the world Another important thing about peat is it's carbon. And we, we know that putting more carbon into the atmosphere is a big problem worldwide. And we're hoping that wetlands that have been farmed can grow peat by restoring them as wetlands and let the peat build up, bringing more carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, so it's a big conservation issue, of course, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really- Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a really empowering message for gardeners to realize that, you know, what we think is a small action in our own little plot could, could actually, when combined with everyone gardening around us, can actually make a big impact for the better. So that's, that's really wonderful yeah. to hear. 
Um, George, we have a, yeah. a, a question coming in from Lynn here, and she's wondering, um, she's heard stories that maybe farmers would, uh, or, or just landowners who maybe don't want their cranes on their land could take some negative action. And if, they're, if they are, do you know if that's still happening, or, or sort of are there local protections in place for uh, you know, private landowners who may be taking aggressive action to remove, uh, remove the birds for some reason? Yeah, the, the problem farmers have in the spring when they plant the corn, a flock of cranes will come in and dig up the seeds and cause a lot of damage. But there's a substance we've developed called Avapel that's available commercially. If you apply that powder to the corn seeds before they're, they're planted, they're distasteful to the cranes and they won't eat it. So it's a very easy way to control that type of damage. And it uh, looks like uh, probably our one last question here um, uh, from viewer Ed, and he's asking, um, and again, George, this might be one for you. Uh, he's wondering, do the wattle cranes stop in Wisconsin as on their journey from Canada to Texas? The only wattled cranes in Wisconsin are at the International Crane Foundation, and they're not traveling anywhere. They're captive birds. Wattled cranes are only found in, from Ethiopia to South Africa. Uh, they're, they're endemic to the African continent. And the total population rich is what, eight to 10,000? Yeah, somewhere around 10,000, nine to 10,000, yep. So not many in the wild, but they're doing a little bit better in the wild than our whooping cranes, which are even fewer here, so. Yeah. Excellent, well- We have a beautiful pair on exhibit. Hope you come up and see them. They're gorgeous. Well, in our final moments, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a great way for us to uh, start to, to wrap up. Remind folks, again, where they can connect with you to learn more, to get involved, anything like that. How's the best way for folks to get involved? Absolutely. Well, our, our website is a great way to learn more. www.savingcranes.org is a really good way. We have these wonderful weekly seminars, uh, webinars that we do. I think we're, we're shifting to every two weeks now, but for all of last year, we did them weekly. And you can find on YouTube through our website webinars that we've run for the past year, and they cover projects. Like I talked about the Kafui Flats. We have an hour long one about the work in the Kafui Flats, and we cover our projects in, in Mongolia and in uh, just countries all over the world. They're really wonderful to watch, and it's a great way to get to know us better too through those. Uh, they're on Thursdays usually uh, about 11 in the morning for Wisconsin time here. And um, yeah, just there's lots of opportunities uh, through that to learn more about what we do. And we hope you'll come visit us after May. Uh, we will uh, we will definitely be opening up our doors in May, and then depending on the state of state of the world, we'll know uh, how much we do or don't need to restrict numbers of people on site and everything else. But we are planning uh, to be open and to get everybody out. So we would love to see you. It'd be wonderful. Wonderful. Well, George and Rich, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story and your expertise with all of us today. We so appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. It was fun to be with you and happy gardening, everybody. Yes, happy gardening. And on that note, we still have more Expo coming up yet today. So stay tuned. We have more coming up just after this.